Okay. Before I launch into my talk, I'm going to make sure that uh, sound is going good here. Let me navigate over. Can someone uh, just say in the uh, Facebook chat window that you hear me? Okay, Cody Hall, you hear me? Okay, good deal. Okay, and I am on camera. Let me adjust the camera here to a better angle. Try to get stay put anyway. Oh, here, let's do this. Okay, let's let's go with that. Further. Okay. Well, hello all. My name is Brad Spangler, and my talk today is about building alternative legal systems. I'll be discussing this from an agorist perspective, and yes, I'm an agorist talking about agorism on the Agorism channel for the Agora IO virtual conference. However, my intent is to cover enough ground that this talk can be educational for a broader audience, both anarchists generally and the general public. That being the case, please hold all questions for the Q&A session at the end of my prepared remarks. Just jot them down as I go along if you'd like. So, building alternative legal systems. Well, in a sense, that's what any political change is. Uh, if you want to go get a, a zoning variance to do some construction on your house and add a, a room addition or something like that, you're you're seeking to uh, have some change made in uh, the legal environment that you're operating in. But in the radical sense that this talk covers, though, we're talking about how to replace the entire system of existing law with a fundamentally different approach to law that is less objectionable. Now, you heard me mention anarchism and agorism earlier. Um, Agorism can be considered revolutionary market anarchism, and I'll get to what I mean by that shortly, but a lot of people may blanch at just the word anarchism. Um, you shouldn't, though. You shouldn't, though. Uh, although there's been a lot of uh, negative connotations tied in with that word, uh, as Gary Chartier notes in his recently published book, The Conscience of an Anarchist, it's really very simple. As an idea, anarchism is the conviction that people can and should cooperate peacefully and voluntarily. And as a political program, it's the project of doing without the state. Like Chartier, I'm an anarchist because the state's claim to justified authority is implausible. Contrary to what, it is, what its defenders claim, that claim cannot be defended by an appeal to the supposed consent of those the state seeks to govern. And so to complete Chartier's thought and explain how it relates to what I'm talking about, let me say that as anarchists we are seeking to bring about a stateless society by replacing governmental law with a consensual approach to law. Well, how can that make sense though? I mean, uh, typically we think of law as being all sorts of edicts and prohibition, do this, don't do that. Uh, that are handed down from on high. Well, that, that's, that's one approach to law, that's statutory law, but that's not the entirety of what law is. In the broader sense, law is simply dispute resolution. Whether it involves some sort of harm to one another or simply some dispute that arises over whatever, uh, people get into disputes, and law is a, a regular, regularized process of resolving disputes uh, without disputes having to become a war. Um, now, one of the fun most fundamental principles of, of law, uh, the, the whole basis of the concept really, is that no one person should be the judge of their own case, because well, if you have two parties to a dispute, obviously they disagree about things. So, if uh, each person doesn't uh, give in or, or, or can't talk their problems over, then you need some third party. 
but where some third party who can uh, act as an impartial referee of the dispute, so to speak. Now, where anarchists take issue with the state is the state's monopoly of this dispute resolution process. Um, and in fact, the state's own monopoly of law itself violates this principle. If you get into a disagreement with the state, uh, the, this will be judged in the state's court system uh, by a judge who is themselves a member of the state, a, a state agent. Uh, and what this means is that the, the state um, claims the privilege to um, be the judge of its own case. And this not only is open with potential for abuse, but it, it's abuse in and of itself. Uh, in, a, in a sense, it could be considered the whole purpose of the state is to exercise a monopoly over this dispute resolution process in order to excuse its own crimes and thereby extract unearned wealth from uh, the productive class. But again, we're seeking to build an alternative dispute resolution process, one that can ultimately displace the state and remove its systematic injustice from our lives. That is the anarchist project. The more narrow conception of anarchism that I subscribe to is called market anarchism. Uh, and that could be summarized as simply uh, saying that uh, the academic concept of free market economics uh, describes a lot of the essential mechanisms for how law in a stateless society could provide for a, a, a peaceful and orderly dispute resolution process. Um, fundamentally, the, the conception of, of law as a consensual procedure of dispute resolution is that law would consist uh, not of uh, statutes and, and regulations handed down from on high, but uh, as peer-to-peer -peer arrangements um, arranged consensually. Uh, fundamentally, we're talking about contracts and contract-like agreements. And where those alone don't suffice, we're talking about third-party arbitration of disputes. Um, now, because the state's monopoly of dispute resolution is not what we want, uh, that getting rid of that monopoly necessarily implies that competition for the provision of this service would be allowed. Anybody could do it. Anybody could begin to offer that service, and anyone who wishes to contract with any one particular person as an arbitrator uh, could choose that person as the person that they would go to with disputes uh, if they have a dispute with someone who also consents to take their disputes to that same arbitrator. Um, so again, we're talking about law as contracts and arbitration rather than uh, monopoly judges, courts, and uh, edicts handed down from legislatures. Uh, now, a lot of people are going to ask, well, how do we get to that world? How do we get to a market anarchist society? Let me give you a capsule summary of the agorist approach to it. Uh, of agorist revolutionary theory. Um, in order to do that, let me give you just a, a rough overview of what agorism even is. Agorism is not a verb. You don't do agorism. A lot of people say that, but it, it, it's a sloppy use of terms. Agorism is the ideology. Counter-economics is the praxis uh, associated with that ideology. And let me define what I mean by that a little more closely. Um, Agorism could be considered the ideology which asserts that the libertarian philosophical position occurs in the real world in practice as counter-economics. Counter-economics, in turn, could be considered all peaceful human action which is forbidden by the state, um, meaning that it is part of the underground economy, the peaceful underground economy. Um, the way I've summarized this before, it, it agorist revolutionary theory in general is that uh, agorism is revolutionary market anarchism and in a market anarchist society law and security would be provided by market actors instead of political institutions 
Agoras recognized that situation cannot develop through political reform. Instead, it will arise as a result of market processes. As the state is banditry, revolution culminates in the suppression of the criminal state by market providers of security and law. Market demand for such service providers is what will lead to their emergence, and development of that demand will come from economic growth in a sector of the economy that explicitly shuns state involvement and thus cannot turn to the state in its role as monopoly provider of security and law. That sector of the economy is the counter-economy, black and gray markets. Well, when you try to explain that to someone, one of the first things they'll commonly say is, well, why hasn't the existing black market already provided free market law yet and smashed the state? Well, the reason for that is principally that we haven't succeeded in bringing about a, a libertarian consciousness to the counter economy yet. Uh, that is, status false consciousness holds the deceived in thrall. Uh, people choose, or people are, are swayed more by. Uh, the potential for guilt rather than profit because the perception uh, the, of the state's legitimacy um, makes people choose to not do things that may be forbidden by the state's laws but aren't necessarily prohibited by a, a libertarian approach to, to ethics. Um, that is, people commonly uh, pay the law more respect, the state's law more respect than it is due, um, because they believe that the state's edicts define what right and wrong are. Um, and that's not simp that's just simply not the case. The, the state is, in actuality, basically an, an armed gang, a gang of thugs, uh, banditry. So the, the principal lesson we have to teach is can be considered a method for when and when not to obey status law. Um, you should decide whether or not to break a law only on the basis of subjectively perceived risk versus subjectively perceived gain, not any guilt uh, associated with the false perception that the state defines right and wrong. Now, what I mean by that, in let me let me backtrack and, and try to review that. What I mean is that the black market hasn't developed uh, to it, its full potential because people opt not to participate in it because to whatever degree they might be capable of, because they believe that the state's enforcement is is not the only thing that should hold them back. They believe that, uh, this, again, the state defines right and wrong, and, and that's just simply not the case. Uh, ethics, objectively defined, define right and wrong. Um, so, in, in a sense, because we're trying to bring about a, a an industry, a an arbitration industry, a, a, a system of market-provided security and law, our, our pseudo-political work, our educational work, could be considered market development. Uh, that is, demand for a product or service either won't exist or will be minimal if people not only aren't aware of it, but don't expect it to be possible. That is, people aren't going to be looking to purchase the services of uh, a private defense agency or arbitration services for whatever disputes they may get into if they don't expect that to be possible or if they don't expect that to have any possibility of uh, having any significant impact on, on their lives. Uh, but our educational work can change that and in large part that's going to be by making the point that the state's edicts are not legitimate, have no moral hold, and uh, shouldn't hold people back through guilt. Um, also, people generally have to expect law and a s sense of dispute resolution to have a basic idea of how it can be provided. And again, that's what we're trying to do in terms of our educational work. Uh, 
and from that same body of people, the populace at large, that's where entrepreneurs that will actually start to offer these services are going to come from in the first place. Well, okay, so statist false consciousness or, or, or guilt is one issue, um, but there is another problem also, and, and that is black markets are commonly perceived as lawless and violent places. Uh, places where, you know, your your leg gets broken or, you know, people shoot you over a drug deal gone bad or that sort of thing. So one other thing that we need to work on is bringing law to the black market, bringing our approach to law to the black market. And what's going to be key to that, in my opinion, is a contractual instrument known as the General Submission to Arbitration, or GSA. The General Submission to Arbitration is a multi-party contract, one with an open-ended number of parties in which one agrees with an arbitrator that she is a suitable choice for arbitration of future disputes that might potentially arise between yourself and whoever else has likewise so agreed with that same arbitrator. Uh, and I'll go over this again here, but in January 2010, the Center for a Stateless Society released a working draft of a model GSA for arbitration entrepreneurs to offer to their clients. Uh, the text of that is largely based on a general submission to arbitration authored by Ralph Fucatello and exerted by J. Neil Shulman in his novel of Agorist Revolution alongside Knight. That model GSA is available at www.c4ss.org slash GSA. And again, let me, let me review that again. The GSA is a multi-party contract, one with an open-ended number of parties in which one agrees with an arbitrator that that particular arbitrator is a suitable choice for arbitration of future disputes that might potentially arise between yourself and whoever else has likewise agreed with that same arbitrator. What's the point of that, you might ask? Well, it, it, it's very simple. At any point in which a, a dispute arises between yourself and someone else, you, you fundamentally have a choice. You can't, assuming you don't just ignore the dispute, you can either go to war over it or you can try to find some other way to resolve it. Uh, commonly, that's just a matter of, of talking things out or you know, in some cases, it's a matter of just simply ignoring the dispute and, and putting up with whatever harm you've suffered or whatever uh, problems have arisen. But that that's not a way to, to run a society, for society to run itself. People have a demand for law, for justice. And so what we can do is we can bring law to the black market um, in some ways through our educational work um, and specifically promoting the GSA as a contractual instrument for arbitration entrepreneurs to use. What this will do is people who have submitted to an arbitrator as one choice um, for their uh, disputes to go to, that person is then saying, I'm not an outlaw. I'm a good neighbor. I'm willing to arbitrate my disputes. And so what this does is if someone who wants to do business with them also happens to be submitted to that same arbitrator or to some other arbitrator who has uh, an interlocking agreement with that original arbitrator, then what you have is, is a framework in place for disputes to be resolved by a, a neutral third party because both parties, both disputants, would have agreed in advance that the arbitrator in question is a, a suitable person to decide the, the matter, the dispute between them. Um, so, for instance, if person X and person Y get into a dispute over whatever, um, then th they don't have to uh, duke it out. They can go to 
any of however many arbitrators they are both mutually uh, consented to, to uh, have consented to use so uh, if you're using if you've both agreed to use potentially arbitration X and or uh, arbitration agency Y or arbitration agency Z or any of those three then um, any of those are suitable choices and what this does is it creates the opportunity to choose who you're going to do business with uh, when that information gets made known to potential people you might want to do business with. Um, if I know that there is some uh, capacity for law for peaceful resolution of disputes that creates a market incentive to uh, favor working with this other person. Now then, that that's the point of the GSA. It basically brings law to the black market by creating a framework for consensual dispute resolution. Dispute resolution. But what about enforcement? Well. There's a, a, a large body of literature on uh, the so-called market anarchist or anarcho-capitalist approach to uh, to um, enforcement of arbitration opinions. Um, but as agorists, we're trying to jumpstart the system under statism. Okay, so because the system will have to emerge from the underground economy it's going to have to first be working in uh, a, a, a smaller sense underground beforehand under statism uh, among those who, who choose to use that approach to law and so you're not going to see these things uh, above ground a great deal until or as the state dissolves. Um, so, you know, as, as the new way of doing things um, has a greater and greater uh, uh, popularity among the populace at large, then you'll, you'll see it more and more openly, but it's going to necessarily be discreet beforehand. Um, but again, how could we go with, and how could we determine a way to, to enforce arbitration decisions? What if someone just simply says, yeah, okay, I, 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 okay, I, I, I lost this arbitration proceeding, but I just don't want to pay. And no, it's, it's not that I'm appealing, I'm just thumbing my nose at you. And yeah, I might owe you uh, compensation, but well, tough luck, sucker. Well, there, there's a way to deal with that. And it, it, it's basically a question of restitution trading and restitution arbitrage. Uh, that is, is so uh, this dispute has been arbitrated and you've won. The arbitrator has rendered an opinion that person X owes you, person Y, a certain amount of restitution. Now what? Well, restitution awards ought to be treated as marketable goods just like any other conventional accounts receivable item that bill collection companies swap with each other. The bill collector buys the debt at a discount, providing immediate compensation to the winning party, and the right to the awarded restitution is contractually conveyed to the collector in exchange. Uh, where a collector owns restitution debt, that debt has the potential to cancel out future arbitration awards to the party who owes the restitution debt for the original dispute. Um, let me review that, because it, that, that may not really click right away. Uh, for example, if person X owes you, person Y, a thousand grams of gold in compensation for some wrong that they did to you, and you sell that debt to debt collector D for 700 grams of gold at a discount, D could sink as much as perhaps 200 grams into collection costs and still come out 100 grams ahead if they manage to collect the full 100, or pardon me, full 1,000 grams from person X. Uh, D then has many options, including options that would otherwise be considered aggression, uh, so long as they don't exceed the amount X owes D. Now, what I'm saying then is, 
that when there is an outstanding arbitration award that hasn't been paid, that hasn't been ignored, that essentially uh, becomes a, a license to um, have what you will from this, from uh, the, the scoff law, uh, and uh, to to take from them uh, what you wish up to the amount of the award. Uh, that that is, it, it's not an arbitrator that would order or authorize any enforcement action. Uh, enforcement would just naturally arise in the context of a free market for arbitration, because if there is a uh, arbitration award that's outstanding that that someone has agreed that they would be liable for, th and they don't pay it, then they can't coherently object to someone then taking from them, however they may take from them, uh, whether that's forcibly, whether it's by uh, calling in other agreements to have things that uh, are held on behalf of that party seized, or uh, all sorts of other options. One could potentially imagine a con artist committing uh, a, a fraud scam, for example, against someone who owes an arbitration award and uh, has refused to pay it. So, that that's a, one approach to enforcement. That is, so long as the uh, libertarian approach to justice is maintained, that, that justice is essentially restitution for past wrongs, then the trading of those awards, of those arbitration awards, uh, would basically create a situation where um, the person who has ignored the arbitration proceedings previously can't really use arbitration in the future for anything that, that has happened to them, or that might happen to them, because, you know, well, if you're ignoring arbitration, then, you know, you, you, you really can't coherently object and you, you have no case. That, that is, if, uh, if I've bought up the debt that you owe uh, for 1,000 grams of gold, then, you know, you can't sue me and say that I owe you 500 grams of gold for something else that I might do to you in, in trying to collect that debt. Uh, it would be a discount on what you already owed me in the first place. Okay, so besides enforcement, what other issues are, are there uh, in, in trying to uh, develop alternative legal systems? Well, another thing we have to consider is that um, restitution ha is a cost that, that has to be borne. Uh, if When people do damage to each other's, uh, they have the potential to do damage to each other that may be much larger than they can actually pay back. Uh, in, in standard anarcho-capitalist theory, that this is addressed but with uh, the concept of so-called insurance companies. And it's often explained that way for sake of convenience. But the, the overlooked context of that is of that is that the role, the role of an insurance firm does not necessarily have to be filled by a traditional insurance company as we think of them today. Uh, Insurance as an economic good can be provided by only loosely organized mutual aid networks, or perhaps by a market for peer-to-peer -peer insurance contracts. Um, however it's arranged, the people who back you up with insurance are your assurators, we could say. Um, well, why would you want to have assurators? Well, because it, it, it's good to have insurance. You might need it. Uh, conversely, buyer beware. Um, people who are seeking to do business with each other are likely going to want some verification that the person that they're dealing with uh, has insurance to cover things that they might do wrong or things they might be, you know, liable for, uh, even with with no actual malevolent intent necessary. Um, 
just like you know you might might want to make sure that your the doctor you go to has malpractice insurance same thing uh, what we need to really look at is um, how we're going to build a system where we have interlocking networks of, of shorters for each other um, to basically ensure that uh, we each behave properly um, so where do we go from there then well there there are just basically two components to what we're doing a, as agorists uh, counter economics itself and education um, and again uh, counter economics has been discussed uh, plenty of other places uh, you know, there, there's a lot going on, uh, so you know, keep building the counter economy generally, and I, I hope that this talk has also pointed the way towards a uh, a narrower subset of, of key activities in in counter economics that I'll refer to as alt legal or or alternative legal entrepreneurship. Um, that would be uh, arbitration, uh, the offering of arbitration services. Um, and, and and I really didn't touch on this as much as I should have, but let me do this right now. Another thing that would go along with actual offering of arbitration services is uh, related services, so-called uh, anarcho lawyers, uh, people who have uh, a service to offer in terms of contract drafting expertise or case advocates for parties in arbitrated disputes. Um, these would be people who you know, might not necessarily be lawyers in the conventional sense, uh, as as in admitted to practice before the state's bar, but people who have that training and background are certainly going to have a leg up in uh, uh, working that field, so to speak. Uh, the main thing to consider is, is that uh, we're going to be needing uh, expertise with drafting contracts, uh, depending on you know what you're trying to do in the underground economy and who you're trying to do it with uh, you're going to need varying amounts of uh, specification on, on what contracts you draw up uh, besides arbitration services and legal services we have opportunities for building insurance firms or insurance networks or networks of shorters or mutual aid networks however you want to uh, describe it uh, and finally of course there, there's debt collection uh, and that could take any any number of forms um, let me review the GSA with you real quick also just to go over that so it'll be fresh in your mind when we go into the Q&A session Give me just a moment. I'm going to open that up in another tab here. I'm a little new to the touchpad on my roommate's laptop here, so it's a little jumpy and hard to navigate. Give me just a moment. Okay. If you'd like, uh, follow along with me. Uh, just go to uh, the model GSA text at www.c4ss.org slash GSA and I just put this up earlier today uh, we had actually published it earlier but I wanted to make sure it was a nice easy to use URL so again it's c4ss.org slash GSA and this is just a, a general template. You don't have to use this language. It, it's really for educational purposes. It's, it's a model document uh, that really should get the point across. Um, this general submission arbitration, it just lists uh, the, the, the points of agreement, so to speak. Uh, point one, agreement among the undersigned submitter comma, the arbitrator's name or pseudonym, and at least one additional item of identifying information, such as postal address, so on and so forth, uh, hereafter known as the arbitrator, and all the persons who may have made or may make general submissions to arbitration to the arbitrator. Uh, two, in consideration of the mutual promises herein, and other good and valuable consideration, 
The submitter agrees that any disputes arising or which have arisen between the submitter and other persons who has made or makes the general submission arbitration to the arbitrator shall be arbitrated by the arbitrator under his or her procedural rules then in effect. Arbitration shall enforce the law of the disputed contract to effectuate its purposes and shall decide the issues by the application of reasons and effects under the guidance of the natural law of equal liberty, namely that each has the right to do with his or her own what he she wishes so long as he she does not forcibly interfere with the equal right of another. Uh, submitter acknowledges receipt of a copy of the arbitrator's procedural rules. Uh, the submitter promises to provide to the arbitrator and then the details of whatever payment terms uh, that the client I I is uh, paying the arbitrator. Uh, six, the arbitrator promises to provide the submitter details of arbitration service package, whatever those might be. Uh, this agreement does not prohibit disputants from selling disputes among themselves without bringing the dispute to the arbitrator. Uh, obviously, if uh, you and someone else get in a little tiff and it, it's not something you want to make a lawsuit out o over, you don't have to make a lawsuit out of it. Um, and finally, point eight, this agreement does not prohibit disputants from taking disputes to other arbitrators they've both made submissions to. So, uh, and that's an important point because we're, we're not wanting to establish a monopoly here. And uh, if someone tried to uh, establish a monopoly, tried to uh, say you can only use them, that would be something that uh, I would urge people to, to not sign on to. Uh, consumer choice matters. Consumer choice is important. That's uh, what we're going through. What we're doing here in the first place is offering or trying to develop a framework for, for greater consumer choice in law. Um, and again, just in review, the, the GSA is a multi-party contract, one with an open-ended number of parties in which in which one agrees with an arbitrator that she is a suitable choice for arbitration of future disputes that might potentially arise between yourself and whoever else has likewise so agreed with that same arbitrator. And again, that's so that people uh, can seek each other out a a as people that uh, um, are, are lawful people. And so, we're drawing toward the close of this. I mentioned uh, counter economics. We want to build the counter economy generally, and uh, more specifically, uh, we will want to focus on uh, perhaps alternative legal entrepreneurship, including arbitration, uh, anarcho lawyers, insurance, and debt collection. And of course, um, Besides the actual revolutionary praxis of counter economics, there's also the vital educational work that, that's going to be driving the growth of, of that uh, agorist praxis of, of counter economics. Uh, and so we, we do have a, an educational mission. Uh, and it, again, it's, it's really basically market development. We have to uh, turn people onto these ideas in order for them to potentially be interested in some of the things that are going to have to be sold and, and traded in order to uh, uh, succeed in smashing the state. So again, I'd like to ask you uh, to uh, use uh, a lot of different resources that are available. Uh, number one is uh, agorism.info and that both can be used to uh, build the consciousness of uh, other libertarians who haven't been uh, turned on to agorism yet and uh, other people who, who may just be curious about it. Uh, and then also I'm the director of the Center for a Stateless Society www.c4ss.org and we're out there almost every day with uh, a, a new op-ed that we're submitting to thousands of media outlets worldwide uh, offering a market anarchist take on the news of the day and we're, we're doing other propaganda work also uh, and so uh, I believe that that in particular has a, a, a key role to play in our educational work 
and uh, building awareness of, of market anarchism as an alternative. So I, if you have enjoyed my talk today or found it, found it useful in any way whatsoever, I'd like to ask you to uh, uh, please support C4SS. We're, we're behind on our fundraising drive and we could really use whatever help you can get it for us. Uh, it, it, if you've enjoyed my talk, just go to c4ss.org and click on the contribute button on any page of our website and uh, donate however much you can. And that will help support the educational work that's going to be vital to moving these ideas and practices forward. I want to thank George Donnelly for the opportunity to uh, talk to you today. And uh, I just want to say Agora IO is uh, magnificent. And I'm, I'm really ecstatic about this. Thank you very much. And I'm going to now go to the Q&A phase. So let me switch tabs over here. And I'll be able to talk to you in the Agora IO Facebook chat. OK. Let me scroll down here and get a good look at what everybody's saying. And the time on this machine is not quite right. Would somebody give me the time check in the window here real quick? Because I don't want to stay, I don't want to be too long, and I, I, I'm hoping I didn't go too fast either. Yes, yes, this is the Q&A session now. But would somebody do me a favor and just type the time in real quick? Okay. Have I taken too long? Ouch. Okay. I've got nine minutes. I should have been off of here at 45 till or at, at quarter till. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try to take three quick questions and I, I have to get out of here to make way for the next speaker and I'm terribly sorry about that. Next three questions. I'll try to give quick answers. Fifty five was good? Okay, so I got three minutes. Let's go with three questions. I'm having trouble scrolling here. Okay. My hourly consulting rates. Uh it depends on what you want done. Um but uh you know, I'm pretty cheap. Talk to me. Uh, but not here. I can, I'm easy to contact. How, okay, and also from Mike, Brad, how do you respond to Nozick's criticism of private enforcement of contracts? Um, well, I'll tell you, I haven't studied Nozick a great deal, and I'll tell you why. Um, I found uh, Nozick's basic argument sloppy, as I understand it, and that is, that uh, he believes that monopoly will arise anyway, therefore the present monopoly is legitimate, and, and that's just ridiculous. Uh, and so I, you know, I, I've basically just dismissed Nasik as irrelevant because uh, you, you you can't just say that uh, you know I think that a monopoly will arise. And therefore, the existing monopoly is, is therefore inherently legitimate. That that makes no sense whatsoever. And any book recommendations? Uh, two. One is uh, Gary Chartier's recently released uh, "The Conscience of an Anarchist." And second of all is uh, Robert P. Murphy's "Chaos Theory." And finally, um, go to agorism.info and you'll find all kinds of other good stuff to read available free. Thank you. I need to get off of here. Uh, Brad, have I read Blackstone's commentaries on the law? No, I have not. Uh, I've referred to some excerpts from them be from it before. Okay. And yes, Jock Coates has done some magnificent uh, audio work. Thank you, Jock. I need to get off of here and make way for the next speaker. Thank you.